Driving Force Radio, where we seek to discover what drives today's leaders. I'm Kelly Delatore, filling in for Jan Mazzotti. This is one of our Energy 101 segments, and we're delighted to have on the show today Gary Dewar, Ambassador, Canadian Ambassador to the U.S. Welcome to the show, well, Ambassador. Thank you. thank you very much for having me on, Kelly. I really appreciate it. We are we're really excited to talk to you today. We're going to talk about how the U.S. and Canada are working together to enhance cooperation on trade, climate change, and energy. And Ambassador Dewar has extensive experience working with this in the U.S. on these issues as former Premier of Manitoba. In 2005, he was named by Business Week magazine as one of the top 20 international leaders on climate change. Before we jump in, I wanted to provide a bit of context to the Canadian U.S. and the Canadian Colorado connection. The Canadian government opened a Consulate General Office in Denver in 2004 as part of a network of Can Canadian representation throughout the U.S. in order to build stronger bilateral ties within this region and then 12 other regions in the United States. Could you provide some context as, as to how can partners benefit from opening the borders to trade? Well, certainly uh, in terms of Colorado uh, and this region, it sells more goods and services to Canada than any other country. If you look at the United States, I know a lot of people when they hear two-way trade, they sometimes worry about, well, is that good or bad for us? But Canada is also the largest customer uh, of U.S. goods uh, than any other country. In fact, we buy more things from you than the whole European Union put together. Uh, we buy more items from the United States than uh, four times more than China. So it shows you the, the kind of neighborly relationships we have are not always above the radar screen. It happens every day. And that's why we thought it was important to open up an office in Denver. There's such a, you know, such a lot of innovation here, a lot of uh, education innovation, uh, medical innovations, uh, energy innovations, energy companies, uh, a great relationship with Canada. And we wanted to enhance that uh, by having a stronger presence here in the uh, Colorado area. Yeah, I, I, you, what struck me in particular when I was doing some preparation for this show is that um, some of the statistics, some yes. of the numbers, and I, I really like talking about numbers on this show because I, I think it really <laughs> brings everything home. It and, does. Um, in 2010, over $14 billion in merchandise trade between Canada and this region supported 263,300 jobs. Yes. Like that's uh, just amazing. And 35 states count Canada as their top export market. 4,500 Canadian-owned businesses in 17,000 U.S. locations employ 568,000 Americans. Like, that, that's um, incredible to me. So can you expand on, on what this means for the economy and, and job growth? Well, the more we trade, the more uh, demand we create uh, for our goods, and the more uh, jobs are therefore created. Uh, it's, I guess when you ha sometimes have the debate in either one of our countries, say, buy Canada, if buy, buy Canada is close Canada, and close Canada is less jobs Canada. But three sentences are harder to repeat in the media than one sentence, a, a bumper sticker sentence. So we think, uh, you know, when something, when a company goes from one shift to two shifts or two shifts to three, it doesn't always lead the news. Uh, if some unfortunate circumstance creates a closure of something, it does lead the news. So the benefits mm -hmm. of trade are not always ap as appreciated uh, as the uh, liabilities uh, that some people may feel about trade. So it's our job to make sure that we celebrate the successes. And I've had, a, as former Premier before I was Ambassador, I had a very, very good relationship uh, with Governor Owens, who is uh, mm -hmm. uh, the Governor of, uh, of Colorado. We work well on trade issues and energy issues together. We just met uh, with Governor Hickenlooper. We have a great relationship with him on trade and trade opportunities. So uh, it's, it's well understood in the governor's office here about the benefit of uh, international trade starting. You always start with your best customer. In business, you always deal with your core business first. And that's what we believe we've got to make sure uh, that message is, uh, is part of what we do as our two governments. And as, as neighboring com countries, um, we also share a lot of critical infrastructure. Um, transmission and pipelines and and their cybersecurity issues and so how does that play into the whole equation? Well on cybersecurity we've actually agreed to what we call beyond the border. We're actually looking at NORAD 
mm -hmm. that provided perimeter security for the Olympics, uh, provided, has provided perimeter security for, uh, for Canada and the United States ever since the end of the Second World War. We were managing that relationship, that risk, outside of our two borders. And in cybersecurity, uh, we know that that is an issue that we have to manage. You know, you don't manage it at a customs uh, office on either side of the border. You've got to manage it by sharing information, by sharing uh, technological risks and, 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 and being very aware of where the risks are to uh, critical infrastructure. And yes, that includes banking. Mm -hmm. uh, it includes uh, uh, communications. Uh, we do watch some American TV. You watch some Canadian producers of American TV with uh, Saturday Night Live with Lauren Michaels, a Canadian. Uh, it, but it includes uh, pipelines uh, from Canada for gas and oil, and it includes uh, transmission lines. So uh, there, there's three major corridors of transmission lines uh, between our two countries. And uh, uh, just like you, we sometimes have delays of getting transmission lines approved. I joked before that sometimes it takes one lawyer per megawatt, no disrespect, to get a transmission line approved. I know you're an expert in this area. We, we're actually trying to get it, that decision more uh, streamlined in Canada on transmission because we want more clean energy to move along with the traditional energy like oil. So, and then, and then one of the issues that are, are that's frequently talked about is the Keystone XL pipeline. Yes, it is. Um, and just for the listener the, that doesn't know, the Keystone Pipeline is a 1,179-mile pipeline from Alberta to Steel City, Nebraska. It's been vigorously opposed by environmental groups and will, is being designed to ultimately serve refineries in the Gulf Coast. Is, is that all correct? Yeah, it's, it's eventually uh, going down to the refineries in the Gulf Coast. Uh, it is, uh, but it, hasn't, it isn't just Canadian oil that's proposed to go on that pipeline. It's also American oil, the Bakken oil. You've heard a lot about North right. Dakota. You heard a lot about Montana. So almost 20% of that oil that's proposed to go on that pipeline is U.S. domestic oil. And now it's on trucks or trains, uh, you know, and it's more expensive to do it that way. Uh, so the pipeline is, uh, it gets uh, some people that are opposed to f all fossil fuels have pretty well put their flag on this project in, in, in opposition. But, uh, you know, we know that we're going to require more fossil fuels, even as we get more energy efficient in our two countries. Uh, and uh, we want to point out uh, that it's U.S. oil and Canadian oil that's proposed to go on this Keystone Pipeline. Uh, doesn't always get in the narrative, uh, <laughs> and that's why I want to mention it to, uh, to your audience. But uh, uh, it has been s delayed. Uh, there's a proposal now to amend the route of the pipeline in Nebraska around the Sandhill portion of the aquifer. Uh, this is an issue the president stated was the reason for delaying the pipeline. Uh, but we think it makes more sense to buy oil from Canada than it does from Venezuela or uh, from some countries in the Middle East where uh, American troops and Canadian soldiers are, are located uh, to protect uh, our democratic values. Right, we talk on the show a lot about our American energy security, and a pipeline like this fits exactly into that discussion in that really we have to be realistic about our energy choices, and we are a highly transport-driven society. We drive a lot of cars, and we don't have a solution for that right now. And so, um, but as a, as a leader of climate change policy, how do, how do you see these issues developing on sort of the environmental side? Well, there, there are people that believe or purport to believe in no fossil fuels. And so, you know, it's interesting because sometimes some of these same people, right. uh, you know, they didn't kayak to Washington right. uh, <laughs> from Hollywood uh, to get arrested, I would suspect. So uh, it's uh, the, the no fossil fuels is usually for everybody else. And I think people can see through that. There's also jobs, you know, the U.S., uh, constructing an energy independent strategy for Canada and the United States, which I believe is doable, uh, that we can work together to have energy independence from countries that have petro dictators that have represented a real uh, security risk in the United States, but we also create jobs. There's a thousand companies in the U.S. that provide innovation, including here in Colorado, innovation and ideas and, uh, and technology to the oil sands in Canada 
uh, which have helped clean up some of the higher emissions that were there before, helped uh, in, improve the re, uh, use of water. So there's jobs in the supply chain and there's also jobs in building a pipeline. Thousands of workers would be hired to build the pipelines and I know having seen pipelines go through my own province, uh, there wasn't a hotel or dare I say a bar that didn't have a, a worker uh, either staying in it or having a beer after a long shift of building a pipeline. So it was good for the hospitality industry as well. Right, yeah, I, I, it does, it has, a, it has a lot of spin-off in, in, um, industry, and the oil companies actually acknowledge that they don't have all the answers, but they've been um, creative, and they created a consortium to kind of address some of the really, the, the tougher issues. And um, what I was reading this morning is Suncor even shared its patent tech patented technology, which was $1 billion in the making. So it, it seems like oil and gas companies are really taking, m making the effort to solve some of these environmental issues and doing it for the benefit of jobs and the benefit of energy security. Well, it, it's good business to share innovation. Normally, in the, you know, the kind of rigors of the private system, you don't share right. uh, innovations with your competitor. But everybody's in it together in the oil sands. Uh, the alpha stage of the oil sands did have higher emissions. Uh, when the oil sands were first being developed, it did use, use a lot more water. But all of those improvements have been, you know, over the last 10 years, are not necessarily part of the, the public debate of people opposed to it. But water utilization was 10 to one uh, to oil when it first developed. Now it's below two, it's below ethanol production. In terms, which is over three for uh, the ratios of water. The issue of emissions have been reduced by close to 35%, a fact that uh, Secretary Chu, who's only won a Nobel Prize for science, <laughs> it was able to m state, although he was drowned out by opponents of all fossil fuel in the debate that took place in DC last, uh, last fall. So yes, these companies are sharing it. Why? Because they are all in it together to improve cleaner air, to ensure cleaner water, and to have uh, a branding of uh, the product that's based on today's realities and even tomorrow's realities uh, with the new projects that are coming on stream that are gonna be at or below uh, conventional oil emissions here in the United States. So it's a, a work in progress on the environmental stewardship, uh, but that's, uh, that's very, very important to Canada, very important to, to the companies in Alberta uh, that uh, know that uh, you, you get defined by the weakest link. And so they're making sure that they cooperate uh, to improve the sustainability, but also improve the brand. Where, um, where do the greenhouse gas emissions come in? Because, um, so it takes energy to extract the oil. Yes, it does. So where exactly is Where it is today, increase? it's above U.S. conventional oil, but below California thermal oil. Uh, in emissions and it's you know it's close to Venezuelan oil which it's displacing according to the State Department report uh, but it's a work in progress so the new project that is being proposed by Exxon and Esso the curl project is go instead of processing the oil twice they're going to process it once and reduce the emissions again to conventional oil levels in the United States so uh, the, the issue of emissions is higher than U.S. conventional oil today, lower than California thermal oil, which we find ironic when you get kind of celebrities from Malibu complaining about our oil. Not that I, we're complaining about that, uh, but uh, it, is, uh, it is the next project on is even better than what we've had in the past. So uh, we're not standing still on, uh, on cleaner air and cleaner water in the oil sands. And, and one of the outcomes of, of using this oil is for our transportation, transportation system. And there's a Canadian company in Canada that's really leading the way on um, converting our, at least our fleets in Canada and in, in the U.S. to natural gas. Can you speak a little bit to what in Canada is doing or what's happening in well, the Well, in Canada is certainly doing it, but there is a huge discovery of shale gas in the United States. and. This represents huge opportunities on the environmental side, on the energy security side, and even on returning more manufacturing jobs back to the United States with an affordable energy source. 
And certainly the governor here in Colorado is very aware as a geologist on the great potential of that uh, source. We think, uh, and I listen to governors in Pennsylvania, in New York and other places, they, people get it. This is a huge opportunity for the United States. Now the most high pro, highly, uh, the, the high profile discussion about natural gas for trucks is T. Boone Pickens, uh, <laughs> who of course has worked in Canada and worked, uh, he's worked in Calgary and, and in uh, Texas. Uh, he's quite a character, but he's pretty smart. And uh, he is arguing for a bridging of, uh, of natural gas to replace diesel, uh, domestic gas in the United States, uh, to replace diesel uh, in uh, the truck fleet, the eight million trucks in the United States. Uh, there's a million trucks in Canada. Uh, so it represents a huge decrease in uh, dependency on the Middle East and it represents a huge decrease on uh, or a, a decrease on emissions uh, for trucks. So we think uh, there's a lot of merit in this. It's just being beginning to be talked about. What does it require to make it happen? Well, the gas is actually here now and being developed now. Uh, there has to be the assurance to the public that the water tables will be protected with the fracking. We believe the technology is there to do that. And uh, we need to have a, a conversion strategy for trucks to move from diesel uh, to gas and a conversion strategy on the infrastructure, uh, the, uh, the diesel stations that are, are around our uh, two countries uh, to provide that resource to trucks. So it's a bit of work to bridge it, but it's certainly another possibility with this great discovery of uh, huge supplies of, uh, of natural gas in the United States uh, and for that matter uh, this kind of technology has also been working in Canada already. And so, so that's going to take also additional co collaboration to build that infrastructure to support the natural yes. gas vehicles between Canada There's and the US. There's a million Canadian trucks, yeah. eight million American trucks. They actually travel across the border, the highways go across the border. So we, just like we agreed to you know, don't again, we don't get a lot of credit for this, we being the United States and Canada, but the largest emitter uh, for both our countries was light vehicles, the cars people drive. And we have now agreed to better emission standards, higher standards for emissions for all cars made in the United States and Canada. Uh, so we can cooperate together on this strategy and, and that to me, makes it very possible to cooperate again on the next step in uh, heavy trucks uh, with a possibility of using gas as a strategy. So it's got to be, uh, the bridging has got to be public policy. Uh, the, the investment decisions will obviously be made in the private sector, but it, there is certainly possibility in this, in this area. Well, and, and re with respect to private sector investment, um, with the consortium of oil and gas companies that are really addressing the emissions and the water issues with the pipeline and the development of the oil sands, it, are, is there, are there any efforts to use part of the profits to invest in that technology? Or oh, there, the R&D from the oil and gas sector is quite phenomenal because they always want to predict where the industry is going and where the consumer is going. So they are... Uh, there's a lot of smart people, but they invest in R&D all the time. Uh, and uh, they have to, because if they're not doing it, their competitors are somewhere else or another country will be doing it. So yeah, the, the R&D investments are being made. And uh, that's why, for example, the oil sands was a massive R&D project because at one point when it first started, people said it couldn't be done. Uh, we had to keep relying on countries like Saudi Arabia uh, for, a cha you know, for oil and oil reserves. And people then developed the technology in its alpha stage and, and it was a massive R&D project to begin with to take heavier oil and convert it in a, into a way that can be used in our vehicles here in North America. Something I think now that's being explored in Utah. Yeah, and, and it's interesting too, because since we're neighboring countries, then all the climate change issues obviously are very closely tied together. So, and there's always a lot of talk in the U.S. about we need a national energy policy, we need to sort of define the direction that we're going. Is, is Canada looking at it, energy policy and, and how would that coordinate with, we don't have one. Well, we, 
we, it's a bit of private sector innovation and provincial regulations and a federal strategy. So on energy efficiency for light vehicles, it was a federal uh, regulation with the unit US. You could actually see it being an international agreement because we make cars on both sides of our border. Actually, we're selling more cars now uh, because the products are more desirable. Part of it, I think, is fuel efficiency. So the, what an, an environmental policy results in a good economic decision between our two countries. Uh, on uh, making another decision, uh, both of us have pledged to be a 20% emission reduction, or 17% redu uh, emission reductions by the year 2020 over 1995. So you're gonna get there a little differently than we are. Uh, you have more uh, coal and, and electricity in the United States uh, than we do. We have a lot of hydropower mm -hmm. that is renewable uh, in Canada, but we've made a pol we've, we've made an energy decision to uh, not allow coal plants to be refurbished without being at or below natural gas emission levels, which are 50% lower than most coal plants. So that is the decision we've made as part of their national strategy uh, to have, again, cleaner air, but get closer to the target that we've agreed to uh, along with the president uh, in terms of the agreement he reached that is more doable than the agreement on uh, that was agreed to at Kyoto. And and what are the what's Canada's outlook on renewable energies? Is it developing renewable energy in a parallel path with the oil sands? And and what is your outlook on that? Well, we I think our our electricity is sixty five percent renewable, and we're really going to go to about ninety percent with these new rules on coal. Now we have hydroelectric power, which we define as renewable. In the United States, they don't define hydro. Some states define it as renewable. They don't, not the federal, all these bills that are right. rattling around in Washington. You would know this, not, none of which are passing, uh, have hydro as a renewable energy. We think it should be. If it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's yeah. a duck. Yeah. It's renewable. <laughs> it rains, goes down a river, you put a turbine on it. Uh, as long as it doesn't produce flooding, you, you, you know, the water evaporates, comes back in the form of rain. Uh, but um, so we're, we're going to have more renewables. Now, the issue of affordability is also part of the, the debate. So right. wind is affordable as a backup to hydro. It might be running at about 10 cents a kilowatt hour, uh, which is more expensive than coal, more expensive than hydropower in Canada, but a lot less expensive than, say, solar, which is 50 cents a kilowatt hour. So part of what you got to do has to consider utility bills actually go out to consumers. So a lot of times the debate is kind of esoteric. I hear solar and wind discussed sometimes in the same political speech. One is 10 cents a kilowatt hour. I may be wrong in Colorado what it is. And another is 50 cents a kilowatt hour. The other key is how do you get transmission? And, and, and getting, uh, we, you, you sometimes have clean energy that everybody wants to see, renewable energy, but everybody then opposes the transmission line. So the same people that want the clean energy sometimes oppose the transmission line. We, we like to have more decisive uh, uh, time frames for transmission lines because it's really important. You can't have a clean energy strategy if you don't have a way to get it from point A to point B. Right, and yeah, that's a that's a huge issue. And and what's interesting to me is sort of the look towards um, more smaller modular reactors that can actually uh, generate energy closer to the load center, so that you eliminate that um, problem uh, of the long distance extra high voltage transmission lines. Yeah, some of these new mo uh, models in nuclear uh, represents less risk on waste, uh, more. Uh, less risk on capital. The, the nuclear plants are huge uh, and the capital costs for replacing them or refurbishing them or having new ones are very high. Now the president had a proposal for credit uh, for nuclear energy uh, but uh, the, the smaller uh, proposals uh, that you know more about than I do here, uh, you know, they look more doable uh, than uh, some of the larger proposals. Right. Well, uh, we've been discussing 
uh, the Keystone Pipeline and trade between the U.S. and Canada. When we come back, we're going to turn the discussion more towards technology development and how the U.S. and Canada are working together to um, collaborate on some of these issues and really commercialize this technology so that we can all move forward, create jobs, live better. Um, stay with us, and we'll be right back on Driving Force Radio. Welcome back to Driving Force Radio, where we seek to discover what drives today's leaders. I'm Kelly Delatore, filling in for Jan Mazzotti. Today we're talking on our Energy 101 segment, and we're delighted to have on the show Gary Dewar, Canadian Ambassador to the United States. Welcome back, Gary. Thank you very much, Kelly. Thanks for having me. So, Ambassador, our region here, Colorado, we have the National Renewable Energy Labs, we have uh, the Colorado School of Mines, CSU, CU, we're in, and, and just in general, we're in an innovation center. So why the Colorado-Canadian partnership? Well, we're interested in all the things that you're innovating on. Uh, you know, the, uh, we have a huge mining industry. Uh, we sometimes have Canadian mining companies along with American companies operating in other parts of the world. Uh, so the innovations that we are able to uh, pick up here and, and other places that provide for more energy efficient mining, provide for more safety in mining, uh, provide for less of a mining footprint in the either in Canada or United States or in other countries. Uh, that's extremely important uh, to us. Uh, and it's, in, you know, we like to be known as a pretty uh, clean air and clean uh, water uh, country, Canada, with lots of forests that we, 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 we cherish. Uh, on um, energy renewability, I mean, we are, we want to have good renewable backups for hydro where we have it exist. Uh, we want to see uh, more uh, energy renewability as part of the phasing down of coal and the phasing up of more renewables to get us to closer to 90% of renewable uh, for electrical generation. So the, the ideas here are very, very important. Uh, everybody agrees with the renewability, but the key is to make it affordable and then to make it available through transmission. Uh, so we, and, and in the other area that there's lots of innovations taking place in Colorado is, is in the, uh, the whole area of health innovation. And obviously Canada, right. we have a different healthcare system in the United States, but we are interested in and always want to know about the innovation and how uh, we can uh, implement innovations that would be more uh, beneficial to wellness of people and therefore less costly. Uh, for uh, the acute care healthcare system. So for um, technology in, in general, whether it's for medical technology or for energy technology, there's always that part where uh, the entrepreneur shows proof of concept, but then to get to the actual commercial integration, they have to cross what's sometimes referred to as the valley of death. Um, and C Canada, I understand, is working with the National Renewable Energy Lab sort of as a, as a test facility. Can, can you elaborate a little bit on that partnership? Well, yeah, if you can uh, provide uh, greater certainty to investors, uh, getting a third parties uh, like the Renewable Lab here to provide credible uh, numerical uh, support for an idea maybe the valley of death won't be as wide yeah. uh, because you've eliminated, uh, you know, verification of something is very important to investors, very important to customers, and uh, getting uh, the good housekeeping seal of approval from uh, the lab here is, is, is very helpful to companies in both, both sides of the border. So I would recommend it strongly to people before they go into the valley of death yeah. <laughs> be armed before you get into the valley. And, and this can provide a useful, uh, positive argument uh, for and save a step and s save money. Right, and, and the, the labs are really amazing at, at using their expertise to, to make sure that they provide that certainty. And um, we're, we are always talking about the labs and how lucky we are to have them here. You're not lucky. Yeah. <laughs> you were, I think it was smart yeah. to yeah. locate the lab here and support it. Yeah, good so you placement. should take credit. 
Yeah. <laughs> you should take credit. It wasn't luck. <laughs> Um, what is uh, what's Canada doing to sort of help the commercialization of technology? Do you have poli specific policies or funding mechanisms or any other test facilities there? Well, I guess part of it is with the uh, grants to universities for research and development. I think that's fairly important both for provincial governments and the federal government. It's u more useful sometimes to get a, uh, a private public partnership of grants for R&D so a company that's interested in a particular R&D for purposes of a product uh, can do it. Universities are much more aggressive in both countries on patents. Uh, the U.S., by the way, has more patents per capita than any other country in the world. You have more innovations than any other country in the world. So some of what you're doing, we're trying to learn from. Uh, certainly our universities, everybody, every university has learned from Stanford's uh, support for uh, some of the technology that uh, allowed them to get tremendous revenues after that with, uh, with some of the patent uh, patent rules they brought in. Uh, the other area that Canada is uh, supporting technology in R&D is in the area of tax policy. We have very, very positive uh, tax policy in, you know, relative to other countries uh, for commercialization of R&D and uh, our tax policy I think is one of the most competitive in the uh, in the world and we uh, we believe that people that are taking the risk and spending the money should get a very very appropriate tax treatment uh, and we want to be very competitive in that area so that's the way we're approaching it. So are, how does that work? Do American companies go over there to develop or is it more just to cross-border initiatives? Or well some a lot of R&D is actually taking place with maybe two uh, entities, one on each side of the border, mm -hmm. uh, for a period of time where there was a, a, a policy on stem cell research uh, in the United States. Uh, Canada did not have that prohibition, so there was a lot of uh, work conducted uh, in Canada on that uh, alpha stage of research. Uh, and uh, sometimes there's a social rule in the United States is not a social rule in Canada that makes it a more uh, a, a more available area to, to, to proceed with. So the stem cell research is an example of that. Yeah, that's a, re that's a good point. That's something I, I didn't think of. Um, during the break we were talking about Canadian innovators and I just wanted to make sure that the listener knew about these things that I thought were really uh, exciting. Alexander Graham Bell, uh, a Canadian, um, the, the Frederick Banting that discovered insulin, and then the discovery of the existence of stem cells by James Till and Ernest McCulloch, and the IMAX film, and, and the Blackberry, all developed from Canada, which I, I'm partial to the Blackberry, I have to say. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so the, a lot of innovation that I think that people aren't aware of from Canada. Well, I have a Blackberry and I have uh, an Apple, uh, <laughs> an iPad, and so my work is all on my Blackberry. But if I'm keeping track of the Denver Broncos, I got to do it on my <laughs> personal uh, computer so I can keep, uh, keep, keep things separate from one track to the other. So they're great innovations on either side of the border. Uh, the, uh, you know, again, the United States has more patents per capita than any other country. So sometimes when people are a little bit down in the United States about their economy, they should remember uh, they're great universities, they're great innovators, uh, they're great entrepreneurs. Uh, the great discoveries that have been made here and uh, it is uh, Canada certainly has its proud moments of uh, innovation uh, and we want to continue that and but the United States has a lot of innovation now we like to think we're, we're good innovators in humor as well so we like <laughs> to have uh, and other kinds of creative areas like the Cirque du Soleil and other things too so it's broader than just uh, uh, direct technology but we're very proud of our innovations. Cirque du Soleil is it Canadian? It's Cirque du Soleil. If you go to Las Vegas, not that I would ever recommend you go to Las Vegas, but if you go to Las Vegas, we have uh, Celine Dion, uh, Shania okay. Twain, and eight Cirque du Soleil shows. So if anybody in Las Vegas and the political side gives us a rough time, we've got them surrounded with entertainers from, uh, from <laughs> Canada. So it was a discovery. It was developed by a, a person from uh, Montreal, Montreal, and uh, now it's a worldwide product. Yeah, amazing. Huh. Uh, I, I did not know that either. 
uh, learning a lot about Canada today, I have to say. I'm, I'm actually a little bit embarrassed at how much I'm learning about Canada. Put that we had lists there. of you have people <laughs> down there that I did. It was a good list. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate it. Um, so uh, from Denver, we're looking at, uh, there's, a, there's a little bit of a, of a movement growing to bring the Olympics here. So um, what's your experience with the Olympics in Canada? Well, we had the privilege of hosting the Olympics uh, in uh, the Winter Olympics, the last set of Winter Olympics. And we, uh, we believe on balance it was very, very positive for Canada and very, very positive for Vancouver Whistler. Now the United States won the most medals, Lindsey Vaughn included, uh, the uh, Pride of Vail, Colorado, but the uh, Canada won the gold medal for women's hockey, playing the United States, and men's hockey playing the United States. So we were very happy with the outcome of those two important medals. But there were pretty tight games on both. One went into overtime, as you know. Our, our view is, and, and interesting enough, I mentioned before that the perimeter security for air and sea was conducted out of Colorado for the Olympics. It was conducted out of NORAD in Colorado Springs. And that's, you know, so there were the perimeter was provided uh, for security was provided by that entity, that great NORAD uh, common uh, program that, that existed. Uh, we also had to learn from Salt Lake City because it was after 9-11. So one of the things that happened is the security budgets went up in Salt Lake City and it went up in Vancouver, Whistler. But even with those higher costs, we feel that, uh, and I've talked to the Premier of British Columbia, Gordon Campbell, the former Premier, uh, the Prime Minister, you know, was part of that hosting uh, the, uh, the, uh, the local communities. The mayor uh, of Vancouver w was very positive. And, and Whistler obviously was very, very pleased. So we feel on balance, it was a very, very positive experience. Now we were, I thought some of the press gave us a rough time. I noticed the British press gave us a rough time about the warm weather. God, you know, usually Canada doesn't get blamed for warm weather in winter, yeah. but uh, <laughs> we, did, uh, uh, we did have beautiful weather. Uh, it was obviously snow on the mountains, but the, the hills, they had some of the races, freestyle skiing, for example, was closer to town. We had to bring in some snow uh, so it could be closer to the uh, major metro area. Uh, but I joke with the British media that I hope they don't have rain on their fish and chips in 2012. <laughs> so I'm hoping we, they don't have rain on their fish and chips. But they were giving us a rough time. But you know, weather, what goes around comes around on weather. So be careful for what you uh, criticize uh, in terms of uh, Vancouver. But we, all in all, we thought it was really positive. We also had. Uh, tremendous experience with the Paralympics. Uh, the wounded warriors were participating in some of the Paralympics uh, from either one of our countries. I think uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, some of the people that lost limbs in Afghanistan were competing in the Paralympics. So uh, take, you know, it's also a very important part of the Olympics for us was the Paralympics. And for a lot of people, as I say, it was, as they see a soldier losing two legs and then go compete skiing. Yeah. You can't even get close. I, I mean, I've seen them train, and I wouldn't want to race them for sure. Oh, no. Yeah. I know. It's, it's, yeah, it's incredible. They're a bullet. Boom. <laughs> down the hill. So what are the what are the steps involved in actually bringing the Olympics there? Were you involved in that or, or probably? Well, the provinces were involved in, when we got the Olympics, part of the idea was to share the torch run with the whole country. Uh, it even went up to Churchill, and you got people like the CEO of Coca-Cola going up to Churchill, we warned them not to hand a Coke to, uh, to a polar bear because they'll eat you. Yeah. Uh, polar bears are not uh, cuddly like they are those commercials. Now, I don't want to commercialize our interview, but it, it's <laughs> kind of, we, had, we spread it all over the country. And so there was a buy-in right at the beginning from the whole country. Now there's detractors. People don't have enough money or the money can go to somewhere else. Uh, but you know the revenues and the pride that come with the Olympics, we think overrode some of the criticisms at the front end. And by the time the Olympics were over, I mean, there might have been a few people protesting in a designated protest area, but people wanted to celebrate the, uh, the Winter Olympics in Canada. And uh, we had a great time hosting uh, the world. And uh, in general terms, if people had it to do over again, everyone would say, yes, we'd do it over again. And you get a lot of revenues. I mean. Two weeks of people watching Vancouver 
is not bad for their tourism business. People, two weeks of people looking at the ski hills of Whistler is pretty good for that area. And, uh, and again, we had great cooperation. We even had the torch run cross into uh, Washington State. Governor Gregoire also carried the torch. For the first time ever, the torch run took place in two countries to symbolize uh, our, our very positive relationship. Yeah, that's that's really nice. And I was just thinking about there must have been some additional border issues between the U.S. and Canada, or border preparation, I guess. Border yeah. preparation. We had a, the train from uh, from Seattle to Vancouver had extra uh, extra customs people pre inspections. If people fly from Winnipeg to Denver, you go to customs, U.S. customs, before you get to the airport. We're trying to do more of that stuff away from the border. So we put people in place, uh, the U.S. did, Canada did, to make sure that uh, people could hopefully travel with uh, convenience to the games and, and enjoy not only the games, but Canadians, Canadians like to party too. So when the games were over, we would share a beer or two <laughs> with our American friends. You know, um, your border people are actually really very, they're super pleasant, my experience with them. And uh, I visited Canada when I was in law school in New Jersey, and uh, I carried in my backpack, uh, um, so Camden, New Jersey, pretty dangerous place. I carried a riot mace. From, oh. Because I used to work for the police, and so I had this riot mace. So I fly with that. I somehow got through security in New Jersey. They probably thought it was normal. And then we fly, I land, and they take it out. What? I'm all, Oh my gosh. I yeah, yeah. So they confiscated it, but they were very, very pleasant about it. It was a pleasant <laughs> confiscation, was it? Well, we, um, that's good to know. That's good to know. The good news is we're pleasant. The bad news is you can't keep your mace in Canada. I, so. uh, I was so sad not to get it back because I, well, I, um, I felt God knows where that it. mace is today. Probably some storage shed. I don't know where it is. Good grief. I, while I, uh, I don't even know the rules on mace. I, don't e I can't even provide you good legal advice. <laughs> so I, uh, I'm going to shift this uh, conversation away from my mace carrying experience. Yes, that's quite <laughs> alarming, actually. Did you, tell, did you disclose that it. in your job interview? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, good. Your secret's safe here. Nobody knows about it. Yeah, that's right. Okay. At least no one's listening. <laughs> Phew. Thank goodness for that. Um, the, I'm going to turn the conversation to the Aspen Institute. I understand you're coming this summer for Yeah, the I'm really uh, going to be sp speaking on early childhood development a topic that's near and dear to any ambassador's heart, but actually from my experience as Premier of Manitoba and uh, the institutes in Colorado, the Aspen Institute, the IDEA Forum and the Aspen Institute uh, Forum that's gonna take place that I'm gonna participate in, got a world uh, reputation uh, for its quality of, uh, of people that attend. So I'm, I haven't written my speech yet, but I'm very, uh, uh, I'm very much looking forward to it. Very much looking forward to it. It's a great intellectual uh, venue, and I, I'm uh, not having not been an intellectual. I'm going to be challenged to present, <laughs> but I'm looking forward to it. Are you? What are your um, main objectives in in talking? I know you haven't written your speech, but what are you? Uh, uh, well, I think there's a little connection to the Canadian healthcare system, but it's a connection to uh, trying to work on. Uh, targeted preventive programs, you know, in early childhood development, and, uh, and also looking at the benefits of early childhood development and you, how you see it, how we see it carrying through in public education and uh, throughout life uh, for people. Uh, you know, we we work uh, we're, we're working on graduation rates in schools, and they can see a correlation between that and and policies on early childhood development. Also in with children, there's also a connection back to the healthcare system in Canada. And of course, there's always a lot of questions uh, whenever I'm anywhere on the Canadian healthcare system and the American healthcare system and how much does it cost and wh where is it different and how are we doing it versus the United States. So it'll, I'm sure some of that will enter into the, the discussion at, at the Aspen Institute with the Q&As that might take place. So in, in actually in our healthcare system, that was passed by the Obama Obama administration how does do you know much about that and how does that compare to the Canadian health well system? we don't want you ie Americans to tell us how to run our health care system yeah. and you w I very definitely did not want to suggest how in the middle of that debate that was taking place in Washington you should proceed as a country I just think that we uh, obviously have a different system in Canada with a universal system 
Uh, it has its strengths and weaknesses. Uh, right now, it's running at about 11.6% of our GDP. Uh, your system is tracking over 17% of GDP. So there's things we can learn in terms of innovation and access uh, from, from the American system. Uh, but we think we've got some things right in our system. Uh, if you ever tried to change the Canadian system, you'd be politically thrown out of office. If you want to innovate, yes, people want innovation, but they don't want uh, the fundamental right of having health care paid for through their taxes uh, altered. So, and then in terms of innovation, is that more innovation in treatment or preventive care or technology or everything, all the above? Well, bed utilization in hospitals, utilization of uh, emergency wards, who should go, who should not mm -hmm. go. How do you move people from an emergency ward to a primary health care center without tying up uh, resources that are dedicated to life and death situations at, a, at an emergency right. ward? How long should people stay in hospitals? Is there a home care system for a person instead of staying in a thousand dollar a day bed in a hospital, they could go and get home care and have a nurse visit uh, for an hour a day uh, in their homes, uh, which again is less costly. How do we innovate with these kinds of things? Uh, so we're constantly looking for innovations in healthcare in Canada because we constantly have to make sure uh, that it's affordable and it won't be affordable if we just let, you know, we're not gonna, our healthcare system is not a blank check. Uh, it is, uh, but, but it is, that's why innovation is extremely important. Where do pharmaceuticals fit into it? Yeah. How does generics fit in with patent uh, pharmaceuticals? You know, how does that fit in with trade between Canada and United, Sta United States? And how does that fit in with potential trade agreements with Europe with, for both Canada and the United States? So these, these are all trade issues, economic issues, and healthcare, uh, cost issues, and benefit issues. Yeah, we, uh, my husband's the uh, Dean of the College of Culinary Arts at Johnson & Wales here in Denver, and he works a lot um, just thinking about your early childhood education um, initiatives. He works a lot with the schools, um, both here in Colorado and nationally, to develop better food programs so that we can fight childhood obesity, which is obviously a huge issue here, and, and just get better food in our schools. Um, have you worked on any of those kind of issues? Yeah, we, I've worked as premier, not as ambassador, uh, on uh, trying to get healthier food in schools. But you got to start with tasty, healthier yeah. food because mm -hmm. you, you, you know there is a reason why some schools, big schools, are located closer to close to restaurants and uh, they provide another choice. So you got to make sure the choice is real. Uh, if you start with some, you know, eating foo foo food that's not tasty. You know, you're not you're not going to succeed with kids. No. So my view is, this is all my own view. I'm not speaking for the government of Canada, but my view is you got to have a real common sense approach to choices kids make in their food uh, right right at school. And I think it's got to be tasty. Yeah, there there are a lot of innovations in in the food industry. As you know, the, they make brownies using black beans so that they have the, that really nice gooey texture. You can't taste the black beans, but they're also chock full of protein. So there are a lot of things that they can do like that and, and using the f uh, frozen vegetables. Um, they're frozen right at the factory at their freshest, so those are actually really good for it, which I didn't, I didn't realize. I thought that anything not fresh was less, but um, those are all good things that can be integrated. And, and you're right, though, make them tasty for the kids. Yeah. yeah if you yeah, if the choices are antiseptic versus really tasty, kids are going to go for real tasty. So, yeah. it's, it's a, so some of the work that's going on, the culinary work that's going on, is really quite fascinating. But it starts from a sense of reality, as opposed to, you know, having some expert dietitian develop food that's really, really healthy and really tastes boring. That right. won't work. So, it needs to be tasty. Yeah. and healthy. I think that's why it helps to have uh, a university do it because those are college students right out of high school and that are clearly interested in culinary and clearly interested in the nutritional aspects and also know what they had to eat in high school and uh, how they could fix it and, uh, and all of that. So um, are there any, um, we're, we're running out of time, are there any issues that we haven't talked about that people should really know about between U.S. and Canada? Well, you know, we've talked a lot about bilateral issues of energy. We've talked a lot about 
a number of issues that are really important to both uh, both countries. But when the president and the prime minister get together, and they've got together at Camp David a few weeks ago and in Chicago at the NATO meeting, and they'll get together again in uh, Los Cabos in a couple of weeks. A lot of what they're talking about is what is the threat of the European debt crisis and liquidity? What does that mean for the U.S. and Canadian economy? What can we uh, what can we suggest? Uh, and a lot of it's dealing with some pretty tough issues. Uh, we were together in Libya just recently, and and uh, in fact, a general that was partially trained at Colorado Springs was the head of that mission. Uh, you know, the NATO mission that included two Arab League countries and and two other countries beyond NATO. Uh, Afghanistan, we've all pledged to provide support after 2014 as the troops are being withdrawn. Right. We're spending time talking about the difficult choices in Syria. Uh, there is not an easy door to go through uh, and it's awful to see the slaughter of innocent children in their beds virtually in Syria. But who is the opposition? What would that mean? Would it even be more dangerous for people in Syria? Uh, these are tough questions. Yeah. And we're also dealing with Iran and the potential for a nuclear capacity. So a lot of what we work with on is in the news is the bilateral issues, but we're really together as we have been for generations in NORAD in protecting our two countries. And we're really together on some very difficult questions around the world. So thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for being here, Ambassador. And thank you for everybody for listening to Driving Force Radio. Have a great weekend.